So I'm going to discuss three things. First, I, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the bank, behavioral science um, uh, in the organization. And then I'm going to give examples, two examples of how we're doing iterative and adapting uh, model in how we diagnose and design and implement um, interventions. And at the end, I'll just give a couple of words on what's happening in behavioral science um, around, uh, around the world. So in 2012, the bank started replicating some of the successful behavioral interventions that were being conducted around the world by the behavioral insight team in the UK and by other organizations like the Water Conservation using social norms to promote water conserva conservation as well as um, using social norms to increase tax compliance. So these were some of the activities where the bank was replicating and testing basically are some of these behavioral um, insights that are being done in countries like the UK, the US, applicable in contexts such as um, um, Guatemala, Costa Rica. And the results were positive. So by 2015, the bank published the World Development Report, which is its flagship report on um, behavioral economics. And uh, that was a very shift from the type of reports the bank was doing. It was a big, um, it was a big wake up call about how important it was to take in consideration psychology, sociology, anthropology, and all of these when looking into designing um, and implementing uh, policies and programs. By 2016, there were two teams by 2017, we emerged, became one team, and now we have basically, we are the World Bank Behavioral Science Unit, where, called EMBED for Mind, Behavior, and Development, where we really work closely with um, project teams, government clients, and also um, international organizations to see how we can leverage behavioral science to design better policy and programs. We're 10 full-time people, but we work with many people across the institution. We, so far in two years, have 29 results. We work with 78 partners. We have 78 active projects in 65 countries. We focus on nine areas, and they include effectiveness organization, environment, health, education, uh, finance, labor market, security issues, such as how to reduce tension between uh, in, 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 uh, post -conflict, in conflict countries such as Lebanon, between the Syrian refugees and the Lebanese host communities. But we also try to figure out, can we improve some of the measurement tools? Can we um, improve how we do socio-emotional skills um, um, t um, uh, measurements? And uh, we do also a lot of different experimentations. So we really work with pretty much everybody. So a lot of our projects, you will find three, four partners involved from think tanks to uh, universities, to uh, international organizations, to local, to government. So we really pretty much a lot of our projects. We bring in anybody who can potentially contribute to the design and the um, uh, implementation. Some examples of our results is uh, in Peru, we did this growth mindset intervention that I will discuss about in more details, where we just by sending basically um, information to teachers around uh, uh, what growth mindset is led to better uh, education outcomes. We also did uh, some uh, in Tanzania uh, SMS uh, messages to highlight uh, social comparison and mental uh, accounting to increase savings. And we saw a 11% increase in just two weeks. And in Poland, we replicated the famous tax compliance intervention, and in that context, it did not work. So the social norms did not work, and the best uh, messages was around the uh, hard tones, basically increased tax compliance more than the famous uh, social norms comparison example. So how we work is we're very much context driven, and uh, uh, we spend a lot of time doing diagnostics. And as much we spend as much resources and time as the project allows us, and uh, the time frame also permits us. But we are also very much evidence-driven. And uh, we basically try to see what the literature tells us, what other uh, studies have showed us. But we also do our own testing as much as possible 
to see what works before we scale up. And we do have an iterative approach where we adapt based on the lessons that we get as we are testing. This kind of explains the continuous cycle we use. So we start off by defining the problem behaviorally, we diagnose, then we move towards design, we test, implement, evaluate, we then adapt, and then we go back. And I'll give a couple of examples on how we do the first step and the second, the design diagnostics, and then separately the implementation evaluation part. So when we do the uh, define and diagnostics, what we do is we first try to look into the literature. So we, we're told there's a problem, we try to find out what the literature tell, tells us in general, but we also look at it at the context specific. What do we know about that context? And then we hold brainstorming sessions with the uh, project teams, government, um, um, government counterparts, all the players, and we try to figure out what are their assumptions. What do they know about the programs and what information they have? And then we go to the field and try to really map up the behavioral map, basically, that's affecting the decision-making process for the problem. So this is an example of a map, a behavioral map, for registering for a conditional cash transfer. And we look at every single decision and action, and we see what role is um, outreach, access to the information playing, what role are the beliefs, the procedures, and also the environment, how is it affecting every single one of those steps. So last year I worked on this uh, study in, uh, in uh, Mexico to see how we can increase women participating in, to participate in uh, landscape programs. And basically this is where they get grants to be able to invest in productive activities. And uh, 100 page report ended up being this little infographic. <laughs> which was much more, more people will look at this in the actually 100 page report. But we looked into every single step and what were the issues, the bottlenecks that were stopping women from accessing these programs. So the first part is communication. So they were not part of the committees where these programs were being disseminated. They're being basically framed targeting mostly uh, certain audiences. And also, this is not something that's on their radar to even look at. And then as we move to each step, you have status quo bias, you have traditional gender roles that affect their aspiration. You also have you know, lack of confidence. A lot of women weren't confident about speaking Spanish. Um, the, the application is 30 page long, available online. Most women will not be able to read, read it, access it. And also, they um, don't are not necessarily participating in the um, in the community council, indigenous peoples community councils. So they're not able there to. They don't have the confidence, basically, to voice and say we're interested in this program. So based on that, we report we're now actually designing intervention, and we're going to the field in ten days to test to see how can we basically improve uh, by targeted communication to reach these women, but also how can we make sure the messages is something that appeals to them and to their identity as mothers, as caretakers. So stay tuned in November, we hope to have the results of the intervention. So one example of the diagnostic we did is on teen pregnancy in Nicaragua. So there was a, the multi-sectoral team, you had education, social protection, and health team reached out to us in February last year and said, we need help figuring out how to reduce teen pregnancy using behavioral science. Great, we started off by doing a thorough desk review based on the literature of the studies conducted on teen pregnancy in Latin America, in Nicaragua. What do we know? What are potentially the bottlenecks? And based on that, you know, there's aspiration issues came up. There's, uh, God, I'm very excited. <laughs> uh, the identity came up and uh, um, access to um, contraception came up, and also the role of men and boys and machismo were issues. So we started looking at the data, what does the data tell us for each of these problems, and having our own internal brainstorming, and potentially what could we do. Then we hold like a half a day workshop with the team, and we wanted to understand from them their assumptions on decision-making process, and uh, why do you, they think this is happening based on their understanding of the context, looking at it from health, education, and also social protection. 
By then, we were ready to go to the field, and we went to four different towns. We visited maternity centers. We visited um, uh, schools. We talked to kids. We talked to parents. We talked to health workers. We talked to government officials. We spent a whole week doing this. Came up with it basically. We fine-tuned the bottlenecks even better, and we figured out, yes, aspiration is an issue, but access is a bigger one. So they have um, sex education courses in school, but they don't talk about sex. They talk about value. <laughs> and they talk about having values as a person, which is great. But at the end of the day, these uh, young kids are not getting basically um, any information about what contraception options are there and how to access them. And when we went to talk to the health workers, the same thing. They were talking and promoting basically abstinence, not necessarily promoting you know, uh, LARC or other kind of method, contraception methods. So we saw that there was a breakdown between what was happening on the ground, and there was this shyness away from really talking about sex. So after, um, out of all the intervention ideas, we came up with a list of 20 potential ideas, and at the end of the day, the uh, government and the bank decided to go with the uh, ah, growth mindset, which is something I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. It's not really what we would have wanted to do because, exactly, again, access was an issue, but it was what they felt comfortable in doing and talking a lot more about aspiration and changing aspirations of girls. So, at the second, uh, the, the next phase is when we do implementation, evaluation, and adapt. And this is uh, the pro a project that uh, we've been working on for the past. Uh, Five, five years with the Ministry of uh, Education in Peru. And what happened is in 2013, they brought together the World Bank, Oxford, Grade, IPA, um, Behavioral Insight Team, a uh, bunch of basically, j -Pop. they brought a lot of these groups that were basically exploring behavioral science and said, help us address some of these problems we're having in education. And they came up with a list of issues that they want to tackle, and uh, different groups work together, and we worked with the we worked with the Grade, Oxford, and VIT on three different projects. One of them was to improve students' performance. Uh, second one is to really understand better uh, biases of teachers, and the third one is to reduce teacher absenteeism. So looking into um, the example I'm going to give is the improving student performance. And what we did here, how many of you are familiar with the growth mindset theory? Great. So basically, this is one of the theories developed by Carol Dweck in, uh, um, in the late uh, mid-90s. And what she found is that students tend to classify their abilities in two ways. Either as um, their abilities are fixed, they cannot change, or that their abilities are malleable, which means that they can change. And what uh, um, the research has found is that kids with growth mindset tend to um, be more motivated, work harder, but also have use better learning strategies. And also they are much more resilient and deal better with failure. So they've done some, inter um, some experiments and they found that it is possible to change the mindset and to move people from fixed to growth mindset. And uh, what, what was interesting is a lot of these interventions were very um, successful with vulnerable groups. But at that point, most of the studies have been done in the US and small scale. So we wanted to know, would this work in Peru? So the theory of uh, change in uh, for growth mindset is that if you a teacher is exposed to the growth mindset material, she will change or he will change their mental models, and that would lead to increased motivation to teach, increased effort, and they will change their learning style to adapt based on the students. At the student level, once they're exposed to growth mindset, that can help them change their mental model, and that can increase their motivation increase their efforts, perseverance, aspiration, and both of these will lead to better student performance. So what we did is we prepared this Grow Your Mind session where it basically teaches um, science of the brain 
and the fact that your brain is like a muscle and it can grow if you work it. Only thing we did was, it was an hour and a half session, it was led by the teachers. And the only thing that we did is we sent boxes to the schools, basically with the material and told them to distribute. So the, the, um, the intervention had six components. The first component was they had to read these, uh, um, this pamphlet about Grow Your Mind that describes how the brain works. Then they had group discussions about the topic. They then spent half an hour reflecting on it and writing a letter to a friend or a family member explaining what they learned and what does growth mindset do. They had a poster that was added into the school. And a week later, um, all the letters were basically added to the wall. And an important part, teachers were asked to mail a photo of the, um, of the once the session has been completed in the wall. And those who basically can, um, there was some kind of social recognition award for those who sent basically um, the photos. So this was done across 800 schools, 400 were control, 100 were treatment. And they focused on year seven and eight, and I think that's like middle school uh, equivalent in the US. And the cohort one was on for year eight, um, year eight, and cohort two was year seven. And then three regions were selected that were close to the Lima. So for the data, what we relied on to evaluate is that the um, um, Peru had a national census evaluation done for eighth graders. And that's what we used to evaluate the intervention. And that basically collected uh, math and reading basically scores. And uh, the schools were asked to implement it in August and September. And in November, the test was administered to the eighth graders. But you can see for the year seven cohort, they had to wait a year. So we wanted to see what is the long term, the mid term effect of the intervention as well, not just the short term. So we looked into compliance, and unfortunately, the method of just shipping those to the um, to the schools was uh, not was very the compliance was very low. And there was a follow up to call the schools asking them if they received the boxes and if they actually um, held the sessions. And uh, so out of the 400, 340 received the parcels. Out of the, when we did the phone verification, only 57% confirmed. But when we looked into actual the photos, only 47% sent photos. 44% um, of the school basically sent photos verifying actually they held the session. So the compliance wasn't as, um, as high as we would like it to be. And basically what we found, was was really interesting, is that we found th that the intervention really worked well in the, um, in the, um, um, not as well in, in Lima, but worked better in the other two regions where we did the intervention. And uh, the results equaled um, four months worth of uh, uh, schooling. So the kids who, um, in areas outside of Lima, uh, who received the intervention, their grade improved as if they had four months worth of additional schooling. We also looked into basically how, how robust the test was to see if there were other elements that affected this. Was there additional teaching being done before the class, before the, um, before the exam? Uh, was there um, any increased preparation? And we also wanted to look into, so what happens a year later? Is this intervention still, um, still useful? So what we found is that actually the intervention was still effective for the younger generation, for the grade eight, where a year later we still had positive results from the actual intervention. So this actually, um, the, the, the learning basically is the stuck. We also, for, for uh, some of the um, seven graders, the following year, we also did reinforcement, uh, reinforcement, reinforcement sessions for some, and we actually found that it didn't make a difference. So, Providing again the course again a year later didn't do a difference basically with the, with the two different uh, groups. 
So we looked into what is the reason why this is working. Is it because um, students have increased their motivation and beliefs? The teachers became more actually engaged in teaching? And the, 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 the teachers changed their mindset about these kids and basically put more effort? But because we don't know information, we didn't, weren't able to collect information on the actual growth mindset um, of, of the teachers and the students, we weren't able, we were not able to say basically which one is, uh, which, what was the reason why this was working. So the interesting thing is after we looked into after two years and we saw that uh, um, it affected that the results were better with the students than with the teachers. So we saw that the effect persisted with the, with, the, with the students a lot more than the teachers. So what are we doing now? So this was done across one year. And then basically, um, so again, this is one intervention across three that we are working with them on. And they're doing like eight different interventions um, with the different uh, organizations. So right now we want to understand better what, are, what is the best way to um, provide this material. Was shipping them, you know, even though it's the cheapest option, maybe that's not the best option to increase effectiveness. What about the timing? Is it better to do primary versus uh, secondary? Um, what is the level of intensi uh, intensity that makes a difference with the intervention? Uh, how many sessions? What is the best way to do this? Do we do tests? Do we do videos? Um, do we do comic-based delivery? And who do we target? Who would benefit the most? So these are the different things right now we are actually testing. And at the same time, we're replicating this in Peru, Indonesia, South Africa, Mexico, and Nicaragua. The interesting thing is in Indonesia, when we did this, is we had uh, sent the uh, um, booklets for the teachers. The teachers did not read the material. So we discovered like they did not want to read the material. So what we did is now, uh, as part of the intervention, we are redesigning the teacher's materials to comics, comic strips, because they won't read the material, but they would read the comic strips. So that's kind of some of the ways we are adapting the design. And that's like now the example of the video we're doing um, that you want to test as well. And at the same time, so the, the interesting thing is another thing that, my, that uh, um, Peru is testing is increasing the length of uh, school from short to long day. So now they are basically, um, uh, we're doing the same interventions in the schools that have short days versus long days. So this is kind of an example. I want to just spend a couple of minutes explaining to you kind of what's happening with behavioral science, you know, what's happening with this movement. Since the UK set up the first team in 2010 in the, um, in the cabinet, uh, um, that, yeah. Since then, there's been a, like an increased number of behavioral science units. And this is, gives you an example of all the countries working using basically behavioral science. Some of them are working with partners, some of them have set up their own teams, others are just experimenting. So there's definitely been a movement. And if I think of the kind of like the, um, the diffusion of innovation model, I would say we're still, we're moving right now to early majority. We've moved from the early adopters to early majority, but we're not yet at the late majority. And the models change, are different. When they first started, there was kind of the centralized model, which is what the UK did. But even with the UK now, that the UK behavioral science team has kind of spun, become a semi-private uh, uh, um, company, what you've seen is every single department has now some kind of capacity of doing behavioral science. And uh, the work they're doing is very interesting. Some of them are very much driven with data and testing, while others are really focusing on much better diagnostics and um, uh, be doing behavioral analysis. And then another good example is uh, Netherlands. So Netherlands has been doing this, uh, they have a networked model. So they have basically a network of experts from academia and uh, private sector that they tap into. And they have small teams where they're doing interesting intervention. And what's really interesting there is that eight years ago, the Ministry of uh, Water and Infrastructure worked, uh, the, their behavioral insight team 
conducted this, worked with basically on this whole project called Optimize Use. How to get people to, to change their mode of transportation. And they did this huge project that included 850 measures, like activities. And the projects that used behavioral insights were twice more effective than the project that did not use behavioral insights. So that's a really good example about how leveraging behavioral science can increase effectiveness of your programs. But as you can see, a lot of the list is as usual. You see it happening in part one countries. That's where the resources are, and that's where the efforts, but we're seeing a lot more now developing countries. South Africa is interested. Well, maybe it's South Africa, it's not developing. But uh, anyway, other countries are also starting, uh, are also interested in learning more. And the type of interventions, a lot of them are around basically uh, changing the touch points. So improving letters, um, improving the website, um, improving um, access to services, but there are also some kind of regulatory changes that are doing intervention there, but also changing mindset. So how do you increase trust? How do you improve social cohesion? How do you reduce gender-based violence? So they're looking into simple projects, but they're also looking into very complex issues. Some of the challenges they face is data. So in the US, UK, great data systems, everything is available, but as you know, in developing countries, we don't we don't have the data always there, and um, this is, a lot of the groups don't share data, and um, so data collection is definitely an issue. Capacity, so a lot of countries may not have the skill set, so that's where partnering with uh, um, you know academia and partnering with uh, international organizations or local organizations is really important. And like everything else, inertia is an issue as well. And one thing that was interesting is the perception of nudge and manipulation. This was an issue in Germany where just by advertising a job, there was pushback from the media. Without even yet announcing what, the, what they're doing, just having a job, there was pushback from the media about basically why is the government wants to use psychology manipulation methods in doing public policy. And also there's the fear of unforeseen consequences. There's the whole point of not knowing what could neg the negative consequences be of doing this. So when does behavior science work at the country level is when you actually have a high level champion. And that's what was happening in, the, in Peru. So the Ministry of Education was a big advocate in to innovation and he basically drove the, um, the ministry in that direction. You need two to three years, it takes time to basically design, test, and implement. And you want to leverage as much of the expertise around that you have. And uh, I know we all want to look at complex problems, but sometimes you want to look into, when you first get started, what can you test quickly, easily, to see if this actually works in my context before going to tackling complex issues. And then again, looking using the existing communication channels. So I find this sometimes hard working with some countries that I work with because they actually don't have communication channels. The way they communicate with the public and beneficiary is just through mass media. So that makes it very hard to know to use existing channels when they actually are not there. But, but in our work, what we try to do is design these channels in a way that could be maybe more effective. And then again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So working across academia and partners in the field and local experts has been really important for all of them to be successful. So I'll stop now. <laughs> and uh, if you guys have any questions. And I have some brochures here about these education projects. We also have health projects, but I felt that this was the most uh, um, good example of how we're doing multiple things. So there's some brochures here and also our um, unit brochures. So please help yourself afterwards. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This is uh, Scott McCormick from BRAC. Uh, I had one detailed question and one uh, uh, broad strokes question. On the Peru study, um, I, I probably blinked and missed it, but basically there was a, you did see discernible results on those, um, on those national level testing, yes. right? Yes. Um, was that, um, disaggregated by the 47% who actually complied, or was it on an intention to treat level? That's my first question. Intention to treat level. Oh, okay. We looked into both, yes. 
So if you can increase that compliance, it stands to reason. Yeah. Presumably there's no spillover. And if you can increase that compliance, presumably that effect would go up. Yeah. But you, uh, uh, presumably for reasons of cost, you didn't do any testing to measure, um, you know, was there a growth mindset? You just looked at the at the test results yes. nationwide. So the broad strokes question is what kind of testing can you do, especially on a short term level, that would allow us to uh, implement fast feedback mechanisms mm -hmm. that can successfully test, okay, has this person probably maybe likely adopted a growth mindset or are they stuck in a fixed mindset? And also is that even something that, um, well, you said it is something that can be taught, but it, 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 to what extent is that inbuilt and, and, and can it be taught? So they are actually measurement tools that Carol Dweck developed and she has short and long versions to measure people's growth mindset. And actually you can go online and test it right now and you'd be interested in seeing um, the results of it. Um, so, so definitely um, there are measurement tools and, uh, um, but for, for, for cost reasons we weren't able to do that. Uh, we did do a kind of a different uh, um, um, study where we tried to understand the biases of the teachers and what we did is we showed them uh, two videos. So we did do some kind of um, a quality st uh, a study where we showed them two versions of a video of Diego. Diego is uh, one, one version of Diego came from um, a high income background and another one comes from a poor neighborhood and we showed them the same grade. And we, we saw that based on that, basically, kids that had uh, um, came from poor background, they, they interpreted the grades and their future, the teacher interpreted the grades and the future of, for, of those kids much more negatively than those who came from positive, uh, from high income background. So we have been playing around with measurement and, and testing, but for the growth mindset, we didn't think it, it was uh, feasible to do it. And, and I forgot to mention, right now, it's being scaled up to 12,000 schools, the intervention. So we went from 800 to 12,000. Christina, Christina Snowbitch with Resolve School Development. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your team structure and how you fit within the bank. Like, what's the process for how you get matched to the program activities where you'll provide the support and how do the teams work together? What's that kind of opt-in process look like? Okay, so the way we work is we sit within one of, uh, for those familiar with the World Bank, it's a matrix, and you have like uh, global practices, which is really like topic areas we work in, like education, health, infrastructure, and then you also have the regions. So we sit within the poverty uh, um, global practice, and I have to tell you, when I first found out, I was shocked because this is these are the pure economists, and the last place I expected the behavioral science unit to be is with the pure economists because I figured they'd be going to be the hardest to change. So that was a very pleasant surprise. Um, and what we do is, so the way we started, it was based on, you know, um, we each had networks of, uh, of a bank teams we worked with. So we started kind of introducing the topic across the bank and you had the early adopters interested in doing innovative work or had read a little bit about behavioral science and they were interested. And now we got to the point where we're actually at full capacity because we have basically, you know, uh, a lot of requests, a lot of demands for behavioral science. And sometimes what we do, we either work on it ourselves or we basically connect the teams with external partners that can support them. If we don't feel we have the capacity or we have necessarily all of the skill set needed for that um, project. Does that answer? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you said the, uh, the intervention was replicated in other countries, including Indonesia. Was it evaluated uh, in any of these countries? What were the results and was there any difference? Thank you. So um, all of them, all of the uh, interventions we're doing are actually, I checked yesterday. Every intervention we do is actually RCT, um, is, is a randomized controlled trial. So, so all of them are um, um, being evaluated. And the only one we've had early evaluation on is on Indonesia, where we found that it's not as um, effective as it's been in Peru, but we're tweaking with the delivery, like we saw, for example, teachers were not reading the material. So we're looking into why isn't it effective? Is it something that just the material, or is it basically something else in the process of the design? I had uh, two small questions. So one is, 
One of the big issues, I mean, first of all, everything you're doing is fascinating, <laughs> particularly for me, coming from a behavioral science background. Uh, the big problem we face in, in, for example, India is the government, other than, you know, the, the unit that's already been set up and they understand it, most government officials don't really see the value of soft stuff, right? So, they, and this is really soft for them. Building a hospital is solid, hard, hard stuff, and that can be reported. Reporting on things like this is difficult for for you know for an NHM head at a state level, and therefore they don't really value it. So have you figured out your pitch to you know these government departments on how you know on what the value add for them? That's one. And my second question was around uh, your evaluation, and you mentioned that you haven't necessarily figured out how many sessions are required, what's the frequency, etc. And, and that's critical from an evaluation point of view because maybe it takes three years for this to really, you know, the growth mindset to set in. Maybe it takes one year. Uh, what should be the time frame for such an evaluation? Because especially when we're talking about responsive feedbacks here, is, is a quick feedback in three months even going to give us a result? Or do we actually need to wait for three years for that result to come in? And how do we get those answers? So I think the, with the growth mindset, it was interesting that we did get results three months later. We came back a year later for the kids with the cohort. Um, I don't know, like right now, I'm not part of the team, by the way, so, uh, but I can find out. But I, I'm sure, I don't know what the next exam can be on how they want to measure, basically, the long-term impact beyond uh, um, the 14 months. So, but I'm sure they're thinking, these are some of the things they are actually thinking about. And um, this, the question on the delivery, um, Oh, so the pitch of the government, I, I know we have colleagues who are working with the government uh, with, with the, um, in India, so I, I can't speak on their behalf, but I can tell you with the countries I've worked with, most tend to be in the Middle East or Latin America, is I try to find out what are the issues they're facing, and then are there any of the problems they're facing that they haven't been able to address that behavioral science can help. So, so I don't try to pitch behavioral science, a lot of them actually don't. The days I have a client in Iraq, they don't care. They, they, they are doing conditional cash transfer, they want to deliver it. They don't want to test behavioral science, you know, they, behavioral science, they want to deliver. But what I did, we were able to do is like, listen, we've done some research, we found out that, you know, there's a, there's a mindset issue with, with, with parents about sending their kids to school, and it's because they don't have the confidence. So we do some diagnostic, we're able to get information saying, even CCT is not going to work. You have to do something else. You have to change the mindset of parents around child marriage, child labor. These are tougher issues that even financial incentives are not changing their mind. So what we try to do is, what is the main pain point for them, and try to basically find an entry point through that. And some like with, with Iraq, I don't even mention behavioral science. It's part of actually designing a better solution, because at this point, this is not something they care about. One more question. This is Nita from Ashoka University. I'm just curious as to where behavioral sciences fits in with sort of implementation science and the continuous improvement. Because at the beginning, if I think it was Sarah who talked about sort of the women uh, in the stretcher, um, you know, the maternal stretcher, which you sort of look at after. That's not a behavioral science intervention necessarily, right? Uh, so just curious as to where those two fit in. Uh, because if you're looking at responsive feedback, um, we're really looking at that sort of constant improvement and where we give it, that is it at the initial stage to get the ideas, but then, you know, we continuously improve on those ideas, just trying to reconcile those two. So we, we think it's both. So we look at it as uh, the design phase, the diagnostic phase, but also implementation because, because we might be missing things uh, otherwise. And, and so, so behavioral science is not just to help you find the behavioral issues, but it allows you to look at the structural issues differently as well. So there may be, may be some certain access that we haven't thought about, um, um, you know, because of the way we look at the problem. Behavioral science allows you to look at that lens. And because we're constantly adapting, we see it as part of implementation. And, and that's how the continuous loop happens. So definitely a lot of diagnostics, but even in implementation. And uh, um, the Iraq project I have, which has been in implementation, we're still tweaking. And we still, I mean, we're running an evaluation, but we're still tweaking because there was a lot of implementation issues we're running into. Like, you know, the health workers are not recording the vaccination visits. 
some of the health workers, and we have to go find out why aren't they doing that. So we try to leverage, you know, uh, uh, so for us, really, behavior science becomes part of the team into bringing in a different angle on the problem versus just saying we're only interested in behavioral science and we want to do interventions that basically target that. What we're trying to do is just to widen the way we look at the problem. One, one here, and then I think we're going to have to move on, but we can potentially pick up in breaks. Hi, uh, Akshay from Damadi. Uh, I had a couple of quick questions, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed the first one, but uh, were the teachers uh, trained or informed about this uh, in any way before the packages were sent out? And uh, the second one, like, how did you decide on this mode of uh, informing them or like sending things to them as a mode of package instead of having a big training or something like that? So no, they basically, we shipped the material to the school and uh, we told, uh, the, the ministry said, this is new material and asked the principals basically to distribute them and that was it. There was no training done. And it was mostly because of cost reasons. And, uh, uh, and that's why now we're trying to test different models of delivery. Um, I'm so sorry, we're gonna have to finish and move on to the next session, but please do, uh, in a break, um, continue these conversations.